Hello darlings, Mike von Billingham here, and this is my 10 tips for maintaining a healthy singing voice through multiple shows. Maintaining a healthy voice through multiple shows has been the absolute bane of my existence ever since I started singing. Um, I've been singing for nearly 20 years now in various bands in various guises, and I was absolutely terrified of weekends where I would have maybe two, three shows, sometimes four shows in a row. By the end of the weekend, I would feel completely disheartened, demoralised. I felt I would struggle the whole weekend And as the shows would go on, my voice would get progressively worse until a point where on the last show, I just sounded like utter poo. It's only until recently or up until recently that I've started trying to do everything I possibly could to maintain a healthy voice so that I got the same level of quality in my singing voice through every single show. Um, So I wanted to share with you beautiful people some of the tips and methods and things that I do to maintain my voice. I started doing this probably a couple of months ago and I've had multiple shows where my voice has not only held out, it's sounded as it should do, I felt confident on stage, I haven't been terrified or scared of the prospect of having multiple shows, it's been an absolute game changer. So, um, I wish to impart some potential wisdom to thee. So, here we go. Tip one, vocal rest. I cannot state how important vocal rest is between multiple shows. It's all it's all good and groovy if you've just got the one show. You can go about your life generally, sort of your daily business, talking how you normally talk and just doing your everyday stuff. After you've done a show and then you have another show coming up, I absolutely recommend resting your voice as much as possible. Um, Singers like Miles Kennedy, um, Paul Stanley as well, if I remember correctly, they would pretty much not speak to people between shows because you think of the kind of, you know, vocal stylings that those guys have. They're singing really high a lot of the time. There's a lot of technique and power involved. The last thing you want to do is fatigue your voice with talking and talking is one of the worst things when it comes to wearing your voice down. That's why I feel so sorry for singers who, when they're on tour and they have to do all the press press conferences beforehand, and they've got a show in the evening, chatting to loads of people during the day is an absolute nightmare and voice killer. So rest your voice as much as possible. Um, No excessive talking. If you need to communicate with people, there's always, you know, the "Mm -hmm -hmm, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. It's amazing how using various hums can get your point across when it needs to. If you do need to talk to people, just talk very quietly, very lightly. Nothing, and don't don't get angry, don't shout at people. Anything like that is really, really bad for your voice. So just keep it nice and mellow, just very gentle. Talk to people at very low volumes when you need to rest your voice. Also with voice rest, um, make sure you, if, for example, there's cold weather, uh, keep your throat nice and warm, you know, scarves around your throat, try not to breathe too much cold air, anything along those lines, anything like that is going to impact your voice. So just rest your voice as much as possible between shows. Tip two, vocal coaches and warm ups and warm downs. Having singing lessons. Now it's one of those things that um, some people are into, some people aren't. Everybody, I feel, would benefit from having singing lessons, especially when it comes up to doing things like warm-up and warm-downs. Now, I have been terrible for years and never really bothered doing warm-up and warm-downs, which was one of the reason why my one of the reasons why my voice never held out between shows and I always struggled. I recently went to see a vocal coach. Now, I've had several vocal coaches in my time and... There's so many elements to this that I need to get across. So I'm going to start off where I think the most important thing is. Finding a vocal coach who sings in the style that you want to sing in. Now, people can say, oh, singing is singing. No, it's not. I'm sorry. I've People want to disagree with that. Go right ahead. Fill your boots. I have been to three different vocal coaches 
or singing teachers, whatever you want to call them. Each one has tried to teach me to sing in a completely different way, using completely different techniques, even down to the, the root basics, where to breathe from, how to breathe. You know, there are similarities and there are kind of, our, I suppose, universal, fundamental, core points for singing. But the style you want to sing is completely different from coach to coach. You've got some people who are absolute belters, some people who are more classically trained, some people who are rock singers, some people who use a lot more mixed range. Um, you need to find the coach or teacher that will suit your purpose. So if you want to sing like heavy rock with lots of compression, you're not going to go to someone who sings opera and that's their specialty. It's just silly. It's just a waste of time. Um, so find a teacher who you can see delivers the goods. Like for me, I needed to find a teacher who can sing show after show um, uh, with good quality and their voice doesn't deteriorate. They know how to sing properly and get through basically a tour with a healthy voice. I found that vocal coach and I've been getting tips from them and it's been helping me massively. And especially when it comes to things like warm ups and warm downs. Now, you can go on YouTube, you can find warm ups and warm downs everywhere. The problem with that is it is not tailored to suit your specific voice and your specific needs. The reason I went to see this vocal coach is because I could interact with them, they could listen to my voice, they could change. Um, their sort of tuition to suit what I needed. You can't get that off YouTube. And especially when it comes to warm ups and warm downs, because everyone's voice is different, everyone's ranges are different, what we need to warm up for is different, and what we need to cool down from is different. So you need someone who can work with you as an individual and tailor it to suit your needs. So that is what I thoroughly recommend for everybody. You don't have to go and see a vocal coach for like weeks and weeks and months and months, even a couple of lessons. You might be a really, really good singer already and pretty much have all the chops, but you just might need the odd tip or two that will really benefit you. And um, like for me, stopped me um, really hurting, not hurting my voice, but struggling from show to show. I was taught um, some, a decent, I've got now a, a good warm up regime. And I've got, I'm working on my warm down regime. The warm down, I never realized how important that is. It's just as important as the warm up because as you sing, your larynx position changes. And I find that if I don't warm down and basically bring that position back to my normal talking volume and level, when I wake up in the morning, I'm literally like, oh, I've, you know, I've got such a. My, my voice is deep and broken and crackly. When I started warming down, I woke up in the morning and I turned to my girlfriend and was like, my voice just feels normal. It feels like a normal morning where I've woken up. And she's like, yeah, it sounds different. I went and did my next show. I, I was singing just as well as I had done on the first show. I was like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Finally, the gods have smiled upon me because I actually got off my bum and uh, went to do something about it. Um, your warm-ups, I didn't really understand how to warm up properly and I was so scared because I got to the point where I was worried about pushing my voice too much so I didn't do my warm-ups properly. I kind of did them very very tentatively and didn't warm my voice up enough for when I went to actually start singing properly so I still had to then kind of warm up during the songs. So with your warm-ups, what you want to be doing is starting off gently sort of, um, and say, go and see a teacher and get a proper personalised regime for warming up. And it might be a little bit different every time depending on how your voice is feeling. If your voice is a little bit fatigued, you might have to warm up a bit longer. Some people have to do very long warm-ups. Some people only have to do um, five, ten minute warm-ups. Everybody's different. The other weekend, I found that I did my first warm-up for the first show and I did like 10, 15 minutes and my voice was pretty much where I needed it to be. So I warmed it up, I tested it with a couple of the things that I was going to be singing, see how it sounded. Yep, everything was good. And then the next show, I started warming up as I was driving to my gig and I found that, you know, it was a bit phlegmy, a bit crackly. So I started warming up a bit, started trying to sort of belt out some of the bits 
you know, tester notes, it wasn't quite there. I warmed up a little bit more. Um, and then finally it got there. So the second night, it just needed that little bit more to get there. And you, your aim of warming up is to be at the level you need to be for when you start singing. Warming up. That's the idea. So that is my tip. So you have get a vocal coach, even just for a few lessons, and get them to give you a good warm up and warm down regime that fits your individual voice. Tip three, hydration and vocal zones. Now, it sounds kind of common sense, doesn't it? If you're going to be doing a lot of singing, make sure you're hydrated. Make sure you drink plenty of water between shows, on the run-up to shows, generally just throughout the day, lots and lots of water. I'm not going to tell you how much because everybody is different. The golden rule for if you are hydrated enough, when you go for a wee, if that wee is clear and not yellow, you are generally hydrated. But always make sure you're you know, drinking water throughout the day. Warm drinks are the absolute best. Now, I tend to drink, um, my favourite are things like lemon, manuka, honey and ginger. You can get the little tea bags that have a kind of nice mixture of all that. I will drink some of that throughout the day, keeping the throat nice and warm, especially in cold weather. Remember, cold drinks, cold weather, tenses up the throat and it causes any clag or any mucus to really grip, you know, to your vocal folds. And you don't want that. You want everything as clear as possible. So... Nice warm drinks regularly throughout the day, plenty of water, vocal zones, I absolutely swear by it. I've got two things actually, certain throat sweets, just like, um, I can't remember the name of the brand, but um, sort of, you know, honey and lemon sort of throat sweets or vocal zones, I tend to actually be sucking on them while I'm singing. And I find it really, really helps. It just helps keep everything nice and clear. Vocal zones are well-renowned throughout so many um, different uh, disciplines of singing as being ripped from opera to pop to rock to so. I can guarantee you there are people who use vocal zones all the time. They're just little throat lozenges that keep everything nice and clear and help maintain your voice. I absolutely swear by them and I buy massive stockpiles of them and just keep them in my gig bag. And you just use them as you need them. I might get through three or four during a gig, just as as I'm singing. You know, if I get a break in a song, I'll just pop one in my mouth, keep it at the side, and it just helps keep everything nice and clear as I'm singing. So plenty of water, keep nice and hydrated, warm drinks. Remember, nothing cold, nothing that's going to shock or anything like that. And also throat lozenges, should you need them. Just keep that throat nice and supple, nice and soft, and hopefully clag free. Tip four, steaming. Steaming is one of these things that um, I don't do very often because generally I find I don't need it that often. If I've got a horrible stinking cold or if you've got anything on your chest that is making your life an absolute hell, steaming is one of the best things for it. Also, if you're really dried out and dehydrated, steam gets, because the, of for those of you who don't know how to steam, you can either use one of the um, sort of, uh, you can buy the little ones that will go over your nose and you'll get steam sort of injected basically straight down you, or you can just get a nice big bowl of water, uh, hot boiling water, put a towel over your head, lean over it, just inhale, inhale all that lovely, lovely steam. That will get straight to your vocal folds and help hydrate them. The problem is when we hydrate ourselves by drinking water, it goes to all the important things first. So all the extremities are the last things that will kind of will get that hydration. So by steaming, it goes direct down the throat to the vocal folds, into the lungs. It helps break up any nasty crap um, and it will just help clear you out. I've known people who suffered with like quite severe chest infections. Regular steaming, like 15 minutes, maybe three or four times a day, has helped clear it up pretty quick. And it will just help declag, degunk your nose, get rid of all of that sort of nasty mucus, or at least help it. So if you find you're feeling like that, if you're dehydrated or just full of full of lurgy, get on it, get some steam down you, just a bowl of water, kettle of um 
just boil the kettle, fill a bowl up. You can use, you know, um, there are things like ulbus oil and stuff like that if you're really, really blocked and you want to really clear everything out as much as possible. It can be one of those things that saves you. And especially if you've got um, very, very bad vocal fatigue, steaming can sort of help rejuvenate the vocal folds as well. So steaming, it is a wonderful thing. Tip five, dealing with acid reflux. You see this face? That's the face of a man who has suffered with acid reflux for years. It is one of the most disheartening things to wake up every morning with sore throats and just think, oh, this is how my day is going to start. Now, for those of you who don't know, acid reflux is what happens when a lot of people suffer with hiatus hernias. The valve in your stomach, so you have your... Um, your the tube that goes down into your so your gullet and then into your stomach. There's a little valve there that is supposed to stop the acid from coming back up. Over time, for a lot of us, we get a little hernia, which means a gap appears, and the acid can kind of circumvent that valve and come up. And you'll know this if you get a heartburn or you might just get sore throats in throughout the night and in the morning for no reason, or you feel that acid, you know, when you eat certain foods coming up at the back of the throat. That can be an absolute voice killer and it has been for me um, on and off for years and years and it's trying to find ways to manage that because it's, it's just constantly the acid is there just roughening up your throat and you don't need that if you want a nice clean voice for singing that's why I tend to sound a little bit gravelly and when I sing my voice is never ever a hundred percent clean there's always that little bit of roughness to it because of my reflux but you have to learn how to live with it and deal with it. Medications, you know, you've got your omeprazole, lanoprazole, pantoprazoles. They help reduce the amount of acid in your stomach. They work for a lot of people. They didn't for me, unfortunately. I tried all the different medications, really high doses as well. It just never seemed to work. So I have to manage it in different ways. How do we do that, we ask? Okay, find the foods that trigger your reflux. You will know it when it happens. Things like flapjacks or, you know, anything with that real syrupy kind of stuff. If I eat one of those, immediately I can feel the acid just coming up. Steer clear of anything on singing days that will do that. So for some people it might be coffee, for other people it might be greasy foods. You know, everyone will have their triggers. Certain, um, certain fruits will do it as well. Try and steer, cut that out as much as possible. Not for, you know, your, your entire life, if you enjoy it. Um, just on singing days, if you don't want to make a change to your entire life. You know, there are things that you can do, but we'll, we'll come to that later on. So check the food you're drinking, uh, food you're drinking, the food you're eating, and what you're drinking. Anything that's going to irritate that, you will know it, you will feel it. One of the most um, important things that I found, my reflux would always strike at night. I'd be laying down and I could literally just feel the acid at the back of my throat. The only way I can get through a night without suffering the reflux is by sleeping on my left hand side. Now the reason I have been told, and this um, apparently pregnant women get told this as well because pregnant women suffer horrendously with reflux at times because obviously you've got a small, a small baby kind of pushing everything and squeezing everything and annoying you from the inside. Where you have your gullet, and it goes down into the sac of your stomach. I know that's way too low. I'm not a biologist. Um, so you have your gullet, and then you have your sac that kind of faces this way. If you lay on your right, literally all the acid will drop onto the side where your gullet is, and it's much easier for it to travel up. If you lay the other side on your left, the acid will actually sit down in that little sac there. And you are less likely to get reflux throughout the night. Now, a lot of us will toss and turn. I know if I'm laying on my left, I won't have a sore throat. If I then go onto my back, all of a sudden, ping, I could start to feel like I get a sore throat. It's so quick that I start to feel the effects of that reflux. If I lay on my right hand side, it's even worse. So I have to try, and it's difficult, but I have to try and sleep on my left hand side. Um, one of the other things, stress. Try and reduce the stress in your life as much as possible because not only will that affect your reflux, but it will just also affect your general demeanour, your tiredness levels. All of those kind of things will contribute to making singing a lot harder. And stress is 
absolutely 100% linked to your reflux. How you're feeling can accept, uh, uh, completely affect your stomach. So um, if I go through stressful stages in life, my reflux is really terrible. Once things calm down, it settles down a little bit and I notice a difference. So um, there are ways to manage it, but you have to find the ways that work best for you. So hopefully one of these tips or maybe a couple may help. Tip six, regular vocal exercise. The last thing you want to do is spend weeks without singing and then just go to a gig and try singing straight off the bat. If you didn't, say you were a runner, okay, and you didn't train at all and then you tried to go for a couple of mile run, what's going to happen? You're going to struggle, you might pull something, you might hurt something. You have to treat singing just like you are um, training for a marathon. If you're singing like we do in covers bands, it's not too bad if you're only doing like an hour show or half hour shows, if you're in originals bands, things like that. If you get bumped up to top slot and then you've got to pull out two hours of high intensity singing every night, you are going to be... There's multiple words that you can use here, but I'm going to say in trouble. Um, You're training for a marathon. You train repeatedly to condition your body to be able to handle um, the strains that you are going to put it through in the main event. Singing is no different. You need to be singing regularly, sing, try singing different things. You don't have to be full intense singing or singing two hours every day. Um, just as long as you're getting constant vocal exercise, whether it's actually doing vocal exercises or just singing songs in an environment where you can really feel like you're singing, not just singing in the shower or singing in the car, even though that will help. Just make sure you are preparing yourself regularly for um, gigs and shows by doing something. You know, I sing because of my streams and everything. I sing a couple of times a week for an hour. And it seems to keep me in fairly good stead. My technique um, doesn't sort of deteriorate too much or I forget how to do stuff. Um, now I'm having vocal lessons again as well. That helps because I'm, I'm trying new things out and um, new experiences and new techniques. So that's all good. So just make sure that you are exercising your voice regularly in a singing fashion. Um, so that when it comes to the gig, you're a bit more prepared, your voice is more conditioned and used to it, and you're not just kind of throwing it into the bear pit and going, right, get on with it, and your voice is like, okay, what, what, what do I do now? Oh, I'm in trouble. So, regular vocal exercise, it is a grand thing. Tip seven, food and drink. Now, we kind of touched on this earlier, but I want to go into this in a little bit more detail. Um... One of the worst things, when it, apart from the reflux that we've talked about, which is triggered by certain foods, is clag, mucus, all that horrible, nasty, gunky stuff that sits at the back of the throat and on the vocal folds and just makes our life a living hell when we're trying to sing. If you have ever been at a show and, and when everyone has their range that they're comfortable singing, if you've got a really claggy, mucusy day, and you go to sing those normal notes, and all of a sudden you're finding that you're kind of going, yeah, and your voice is kind of petering out because it feels like like you're trying to push through a layer of muck. Imagine you're kind of um, swimming in soup, and you're trying to break through to the surface, and you're it's just kind of, uh, no, I can't get through, and you have to push that extra bit hard to make sure that your note actually breaks through. That's what it's like singing with mucus and clag. Um, so what can we do to try and prevent that? Look at the foods you eat. Now, when we eat food, obviously our body produces more mucus. That That's unavoidable. But having like a massive dinner before singing is not a great idea because not only does it fill you up and make you bloated, but also you've got a lot more mucus going around in the body. There's more mucus on the vocal folds and in the throat and everywhere. It's just going to make your life harder. So try not to eat massive um, dinners before you sing. Also, I find, for me personally, what I tend to do, if I've got multiple... I am a sucker for chocolate and things like, um, you know, fizzy drinks. Now, they are really bad for trying to sing. Again, because they sort of coat everything. And you don't want that. You want your vocal folds and your throat and everything to be as clean as possible. 
So I find I cut out fizzy drinks. I cut out the chocolate. I try not to have too much dairy, um, even though I love dairy. So general rule, on the day of, that you're going to sing, kind of cut, go real basic in your diet. Cut out anything that really tastes nice, <laughs> pretty much. So um, anything that's kind of slimy, oily, um, that will sort of put layers of stuff in your throat. Get rid of those and you'll find that your voice feels cleaner, um, crisper, and you won't have that horrible feeling of, I've got to go for a note, I've got to push harder to make sure that note resonates and doesn't get have all that clag, just go and stick around your vocal folds. And because you're having to push harder to get through to that note, what you find happens is your voice fatigues more because you're not able to control as much and you're having to really force through. So... Just be sensible with um, what you eat and drink. Things like, you know, coffee, alcohol. Some people are okay with them singing. A lot of people aren't. So just try cutting all that stuff out on gig nights and gig days. See how it makes you feel. You never know. You might be pleasantly surprised. Tip eight. In-ear monitoring. Ah, In-ear monitoring. The gift from above. It was the best investment that I ever made as a musician. Imagine the scene. You're out on stage and you're using monitors to be able to hear your voice. You've got a drummer who's immensely loud. All the guitars are turned up to 15 and you are having to sing so loudly just to try and hear yourself that you're just blowing your voice out on regular occasions. Okay, we have all been there. You're at the mercy of the sound man. You know, you don't know whether he's a good sound man, he's a bad sound man. If you're a particularly loud singer or a quiet singer, he might not be able to push the monitors up enough to be able to hear yourself cleanly. In-ear monitoring can solve all of that. Because one of the things it does is if everybody can hear themselves within ears nice and clearly, there is less need for sort of massive amounts of volume from monitors. There's no need for monitors. So it reduces feedback. It reduces sort of so much extra spill from the rest of the band. And you can control how much of each man, uh, each band member you want to hear in your in-ears. And you can get as close to a perfect mix as possible and just be so much happier. So it's the difference between... Um, having a show where you can't hear anything and you're screaming your guts out and you just come away and you don't even know how you sounded, to be able to hear your voice completely clearly and crisply so that you can have much more control and manipulate your voice and perform better. So we've talked about in-ear monitoring before and various things, so I won't stick on it too long. But anybody who uses it, who will very rarely ever goes back to monitors because it just changes the game and it makes your experience of being a singer far more enjoyable. So in ear monitors will it will save your vocal life, everyone. All right. Tip nine: know your limits. Now there's a uh, bit of information for life. I think we can all learn from when singing, knowing what your voice can do, when it can do it, and what it can't do. We learn this through experience. Okay, so we might try things, uh, it will hurt our voice, we know not to do that again if we learn our lessons correctly, we know if our voice is feeling a certain way, what we can do, how we can work around it if it's not quite up to what it needs to be. You want to make your life as easy as possible, but in, in a way that you can sing your best. One of the ways to do that, and we've talked about this in other videos before, is plan your set accordingly. If you know how your voice works and you know that your voice is best at the start and then it struggles towards the end of the night, tailor your voice to suit that. Do anything that's difficult or sort of, you know, um, that you, sh you would normally struggle with later on, early on. If you need to have a band member come in and sing a song to give you a little break, having a break in a set while someone else either does, why do you think... Um, these big headline bands have guitar solos, drum solos, you know, where that musician will take centre stage. Yes, it's to show off their skills, but the, one of the big reasons is to give that singer a chance to have a breather. Because if you're knocking out song after song after song and you're starting to struggle, 
you can feel it like a huge weight weighing in on you. Having that break gives you a chance to regroup, recoup, and you kind of, I can start to breathe again. So that's another really important tip. If you've got a musician who can just step in and give you that little break, awesome. That can that can make life so much easier and you so much happier. So plan your set accordingly. Have little breaks if you can. And as I've said before, do not be dictated to by your band about songs that they think you should sing if you can't sing them. Okay? I've said this before. If your guitarist is like, yeah, we should do all these really difficult numbers, and you say, okay, can you sing them? Well, no. Well, why not? I think you should sing them. Well, I'm not a singer. Okay, okay. so don't then dictate to me how the singer, what they should sing and how they should sing it. If a guitarist, you went up to guys, okay, I want you to, I want to cover a dream theatre song and you've got to nail this ridiculously hard John Petrucci song. He's like, well, I can't play that. Well, no, but I think we still should. You're a guitarist. You should be able to play it. You know, you are the singer. You know what you can and can't do. Do not be dictated to by other members of the band or told what you should be singing. Okay, because what you do, okay, if they're playing stuff that's a bit out of their comfort zone, they're not going to blow their voice out or possibly get nodes on their um, vocal folds or anything like that. You know, you they don't fully understand what it's like unless they sing themselves. Okay, being a singer is an organic instrument. And you can really hurt it and do yourself long-term damage if it's not looked after properly or you push yourself into realms that your voice can't handle. So stand your ground. Don't let people push you around. Make sure that you are picking a set and songs that work for your voice. Tip number 10, the realities of real life. It would be great if we could all the sort of a live this wonderful clean existence where we are almost like zen creatures who don't put anything nasty or toxic into our bodies and every time we sang we sounded like a a choir of angels and everything was hunky-dory life doesn't work like that we are as singers are at the mercy of what we eat what we drink um how much sleep we've had what's the pollen count like everything you can imagine can be um arrayed against us when it comes to singing So we have to manage our expectations of what we can do. If you do drugs and you drink alcohol and smoke, you are going to have a tougher time. Now, I'll be honest, for some people, smoking and drinking does not affect their voice at all. For some people, it gives it a bit more attack and a bit more gravel and grip. They might like that. It's what works for you. Now, certain drugs will cause you problems. One of the greatest downfalls of many of the bands in the 80s was cocaine. Cocaine burns through your nose and throat. I've known people, sadly, who've been serious co- uh, cocaine addicts, and they've gone from having a normal voice to having a voice that sounds like that. That's going to be no good for singing. And the more drugs you do, the worse your body will feel, the worse your voice will get. And you can just look through a lot of these 80s, especially the 80s rock artists, watch their performances as the tours get more gruelling, the drugs get more uh, available, and you can see the quality of their voices deteriorate over time. And that's why a lot of those singers from that period lost their voices or the voices got damaged and were never the same again due to um, substance abuse. So if you want to maintain a healthy voice, don't put loads of horrible muck in your body, basically. Also remember, uh, food and drink is one of the things that will affect your voice as well. Also, depends what job you do. If you're not fortunate enough to be a musician full time and you have to work where you have, for example, you might work in a call centre and you're having to talk to people every day on a regular basis that is going to fatigue your voice something chronic so that when you come to play a show you're going to really really struggle so you have to look at what goes on in your life and what's more important um and these are all decisions that we have to make for ourselves you know how much sleep you get um your diet your recreational use of various substances um it can even be the climate you live in you know, really dry climates can be really difficult for, for singers, such as really cold climates can be as well. So you have to manage your expectations with the realities of real life. If you want to enjoy 
um, some of the fruits of your labours and life, then it may affect your voice a little bit. You know, there's that happy medium. Uh, if you live a completely clean, healthy existence, your voice might be much, much better. But it depends. You have to, you know, those scales of life between fun and job and duty, you have to kind of get them to where you want them to be. And for me, I do like to indulge in some chocolate and some, you know, fizzy drinks now and then. And I don't often sleep. I've sleep very badly quite a lot of the time. So my voice is very rarely ever 100%. And I probably could make it a bit better, which I am doing by having vocal lessons and things like that and trying to implement different techniques. But, you know... I'm not going to be Miles Kennedy, a man who religiously looks after his voice, trains it regularly and can go out and pretty much consistently bang out some of the most difficult songs to sing on a regular basis. You know, that man and professional singers know that they have a job to do and they they have a commitment to themselves and their voice to look after it. If you want to go down that road, I fully respect you. For me personally... If I had to, if I did, uh, tours became available and I had to do that, I would have to do that because otherwise I'd be letting people down. Depends on what you've got going on in your life and what you want to achieve. So tailor it to suit you, but always know that there is more that you can do if you, you know, have the motivation to do it. Okay, then you beautiful lovelies, that has been my 10 tips for helping to maintain a good healthy voice through multiple shows. Um, I hope some of these tips are of help to you. And if they are, please let me know in the comments. I love to hear your feedback. Um, The exchange between us, I really, really value. And it's always nice to hear not only if it's helped you, but also if you've got any really good tips for singing, helping to survive multiple shows, please post them down there. We're all learning from each other. It's a wonderful thing. The more information we can impart to each other and help us out through this crazy, crazy journey called life, the better. So much love to you all. Thank you for your continued support. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel and click the bell, etc. and everything, please do. Um, It really means the world having you guys here and uh, exchanging information with you. So take care. All the best. Much love to you.